introduction to wappen wharf a frightful comedy of pirates by charles s brooks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org dramatis personae the duke read by son of the exiles patch eye read by larry wilson the Captain, read by Lian Yao. Red Joe, read by Thomas Peter. Darlin, read by T. J. Burns. Betsy, read by Devora Allen. Owl Meg is read by Linda Fitek. Sailor Captain, read by Alan Mapstone. Introduction, read by Todd stage directions read by sonia prologue our scene is the wind-swept coast of devon by day there is a wide stretch of ocean far below and the abutments of our stage arise from a dizzy cliff the time is remote and ships of forgotten build stand out from bristol in full sail for the mines of india but we must be loose and free of precise date lest our plot be shamed by broken fact. A thousand years are but as yesterday. We make but a general gesture to the dim spaces of the past. The village of Covelli climbs in a single street, a staircase really, and it is fagged and out of breath halfway. But far above, on a stormy crag, clinging by its toes, there stands a pirate's hut. To this topmost ledge fishwives sometimes scramble by day, but when a wind shall search the crannies of the night, then no villager would dare to climb so high. You will seek today in vain the pirate's cabin. Since the adventure of our play, a thousand tempests have snarled across these rocks. You must convince your reason that these pinnacles of yesteryear, toppled down by storm, lie buried in the sea. We had hoped that our drama's scene might lie on a pirate ship at sea. We had wished for a swaying mast, full set with canvas, a typhoon to smother our stage in wind. We had hoped to walk a victim off the plank with a sea roaring in the wings. But our plot deals stubbornly with us. Alas, our pirates grow old and stiff. They have retired, as we say, from active practice, and live in easy luxury on shore. Yet we shall see that their villainy still thrives how shall we select a name for our frightful play there is a wharf in london that is known as wapping in these days that we call the present it has sunk to common use and its rotten timbers are piled with honest unromantic merchandise but once a gibbet stood on wapping wharf and pirates were hanged upon it it was the first convenient harborage for inbound ships to dispose of this dirty deep-sea cargo so it was the sombre motive of a pirate's life, his moment of reflection after he had slit his victim's throat. Tonight, although your beards grow long and time has marked its net of wrinkles, tonight the years spin backwards. Only the young in heart will catch the slender meaning of our play. We are too quick to think that childhood passes with the years, that its fine fancy is blunted with the practice of the world. Too long have we been taught that the clouds of glory fade in the common day. If a man permits, a child keeps house within his heart. Our prologue outstays its time. Already the captain of our pirates puts on his hook. The evil duke limps for practice on his wooden leg. Presently our curtain will rise. We shall see the pirate's cabin with the lighthouse in the distance, Flint's lantern and the ladder to the sleeping loft. We shall hear a storm unparalleled, thunder lightning and the rush of wind if it can be managed then our candles burn to socket our pasteboard cabin grows dark the blustering ocean the dizzy cliffs of devon melt like an unsubstantial pageant once again despite the signpost of the years we have run on the laughing avenues of childhood by way of explanation several weeks ago an actor-manager requested me to try my hand at a play for the winter season. The offer was unexpected. My dear sir, I said, I am immensely flattered, but 
I have never written a play. Then I hastened to ask, What kind of play? For fear the offer might be withdrawn. He replied with sureness and decision, I want a play, he said, with lots of pirates, and no poetry. He stressed this with an emphatic gesture. And at least one shooting, he added. It was a slim prescription. He left me to brood upon the matter. The proposal was too flattering to be rejected out of hand. After a furious week upon a plot and dialogue, I was given an opportunity to display my wares. The manager himself met me in the hallway. Is there a shooting? he asked, with what seemed almost a suppressed excitement. I was able to satisfy him, and he led me to his inner office, where he pointed out an easy chair. The room was pleasantly furnished with bookshelves to the ceiling. Evidently his former ventures had been prosperous, and already I imagined myself come to fortune as his partner. While I fumbled with embarrassment at my papers, for I dreaded his severe opinion, he himself fetched a basket of coal for a fire that burned briskly on the hearth. Then he sat rigidly at attention. It now appeared that he had summoned to our conference several of his associates, the subordinates, merely, of his ventures, his manager of finance, with a sharp eye for a business flaw, his customer and designer, and another person who is his reader and adviser, and, in emergency, fills and mends any sudden gap that shows itself. My notion of theatrical managers has been that they are a cold and distant race, the more sullen cousin of an editor. Is it not considered that on the reading of a play they sit with fallen chin, and that they chill an author to reduce his royalty? It is not, it is not, saith the buyer. I am told that even the best plays are hawked with disregard from theatre to theatre until the hungry author is out at elbow. They get less civility than greets a mean commodity. Worthless mining shares and shoddy gilt editions do not kick their heels with such disregard in the outer office. Popcorn and apple, Armenian laces even, beg a quicker audience. But none of this usual brusqueness appeared. Rather, he showed an agreeable enthusiasm as we proceeded, even an unrestraint, which, I must confess, at times somewhat marred his repose and dignity. Manifestly, it was not his intention to depreciate my wares. He exchanged frank glances of approval with his subordinates, with his costumer especially, with whom his relation seems the closest. In the first act of my play, when it becomes apparent that one of my pirates goes stumping on a timber leg, his eye flashed. And when it was disclosed that the captain wears a hook instead of a hand, he forgot his professional restraint and cried out his satisfaction. He was soon wrapped in thought by the mysterious behavior of the fortune-teller, and he said if she were short and stout he had the very actress in his mind. But it was in the second act that he threw caution to the winds. As you will know presently, Red Joe, one of my pirates, seizes his trusty gun, and, taking breathless aim, shoots. But I must not expose my plot. At this exciting moment, which is quite the climax of my play, Velasco, or any of his kind, would have squinted for a flaw. He would have tilted his wary nose upon the ceiling and told me that my plot was humbug. What sailor man would mistake a lantern for a lighthouse? Nor were there lighthouses in the days of the buccaneers. He would have scuttled my play in dock and grinned at the rising bubbles. Mark the difference. My manager, ignoring these inconsequential errors, burst from his chair, this is amazing, and turned a reckless somersault between the table and the fire. His costumer, who knows best how his eccentricity runs to riot, checked him for this and sent him to his chair. He sobered for a minute, and the play went on. Presently, however, when the enraged pirates gathered to wreak vengeance on their victim, I saw how deeply he was moved. His exultant eye sought the bookshelves, and I fancied that he was in meditation whether he might be allowed a handstand with his heels waving against the ceiling. His excited fingers obviously were searching for a dagger in his boot. You may conceive my pleasure. If his cold and practiced judgment could be so stirred, might I not hope that the phlegmatic pit in shiny shirt-fronts would rise and shout its approval at our opening? And to what reckless license might not the gallery yield? I fancied a burst of somersaults in the upper gloom, and tremendous handsprings, both men and women, down the sharp-pitched aisle. It would be shocking, this giddy flash of lingerie, except that our broader times now give it countenance. 
Keeping Tom, late of Coventry, in these more generous days, need no longer sit like a sneak in his private shutter. He has only to travel to the beach where a hundred Godivas crowd the sands. I saw myself on the great occasion of our opening night, bowing in white tie from the forward box. Our conference was successful. When the reading of the play was finished, and the wicked pirate stood in the shadow of the gibbet, he thanked me, and excused himself from further attendance by reason of a prior engagement. Under the stress of selection for his theatre he cannot sleep at night, and his costumer wisely packs him off early to his bed. She whispers to me, however, that although he had hopes for a storm at sea and a hanging at the end, his decision, nevertheless, is cast in my favour for a quick production, whenever a worthy company can be assembled. But we have gone still further towards our opening. Our manager has already whittled a dozen daggers, and they lie somewhere on a shelf, awaiting a coat of silver paint. On the tip of each he has bargained for a spot of red. Furthermore, he owns a pistol, a harmless, devicerated thing, and he pops it daily at any rogue that may be lurking on the cellar stairs. All pirates wear pigtails. Pirates, that is, of the upper crust. The kids and flints and morgans. And at first this was a naughty problem. But he obtained a number of old stockings. Stockings, of course, beyond the skill of that versatile person who mends the gaps. And he has wound them on wires, curling them upward at the end and tying them with bits of ribbon. The pirate captain is allowed an extra inch of pigtail to exalt him above his fellows. When he first adjusted this pigtail on himself, his costumer cried out that he looked like a Chinaman. This was downright stupidity, and was hardly worthy of her perception. But ladies cannot be expected to recognize a pirate so instinctively as we rougher men. The stocking, however, was clipped to have its length, and now he is every inch a buccaneer. As to the pirate's hook, he is resourcefulness itself. These things are secrets of the craft, but I may hint that there is a very suitable hook in a butcher shop round the corner. Surely the butcher, warmed to generosity by the family patronage, would lend it for the great performance. I have no doubt but that the manager, from this time forward, will beg all errands in his direction, and that his smile will thaw the friendly butcher to his purpose. Certainly two legs of lamb, if whispered that the drama is at stake, will consent to hang for one tremendous day upon a single hook. Our hook is to be screwed into a block of wood, and there is something about knuckles and a cord around the wrist and a long sleeve to cover up the joining. Anyway, the problem has been met. In the furnace room he has found a heavy sheet of tin for the thunderstorm, and I have suggested that he dig in a nearby gravel pit for a basket of rain to hurl against the pirate's window. But hard beans, he says, are better, and he has won the cook's consent. For the slow monotone of water dripping from the roof in our second act, a single bean, he tells me, dropped gently in a pan, is a baffling counterfeit. The lightning seems not to bother him, for he owns a pocket flashlight, but the mighty wind that comes brawling from the ocean was at first a sticker. The vacuum cleaner popped into his head, but was put aside. The fireplace bellows were too feeble for any wind that had grown a beard. His manager of finance, however, laid aside his book one night, a weary tract upon the law, and displayed an ability to moan and whistle through his teeth. The very casement rattled in the blast. He has agreed to sit in the winds and loose a sufficient storm upon a given signal. Our stage is cramped. Three strides stretch from side to side. Can this cockpit, you ask, hold the vasty fields of France? It is not, of course, the vasty fields of France that we are trying to hold, but we do lack space for the kind of riot the manager has in mind in the final scene. He wants nothing girlish. Sabres and pistols are his demand, a knife between the teeth, and more yelling than I could possibly put down in print. A bench must be upset, the beer cask overturned, a jug of Darlin's grog spilled, and one stool, at least, must be smashed, preferably on the captain's head, who must, however, be consulted. Patchy and the Duke are not the kind of pirates that lie down and whine for mercy at a single punch. At first, our manager was baffled how the pirates were to ascend a ladder to their sleeping loft. They had no place to go. They would crack their ugly heads upon the ceiling. The costumer was positive, parsimony, that a hole, even a little hole, should not be cut in the plaster overhead for their disappearance. If the chandelier had been an honest piece of metal, they might have perched on it until the act ran out. Or perhaps the candles could be extinguished when their legs were still climbing visibly. At last, the manager has contrived that a plank be laid across the top of two step-ladders, 
behind a drop so the audience cannot see. No reasonable pirate could refuse to squat upon the plank until the curtain fell. We are getting on. Our company has been selected. We need only a handful of actors, but the manager has enlisted the street. The dearest little girl has been chosen for Betsy, and each day she practices her lullaby at the piano with uncertain, questing finger. A gentle rowdy of twelve will speak the Duke's blood-curdling lines. I understand that two quarrelsome pirates have nearly come to blows which shall act the captain. The hero, Red Joe, will be played by the manager himself, for it is he who owns the pistol. Is not the boy who has the baseball the captain of his nine? I owe an apology to all the mothers of our caste, for the rough language of my lines outweighs their gentler home instruction. Whenever several of our actors meet, there is used the vile language of the sea. By the bones of my ten fingers has replaced the anemic oaths of childhood. One little girl has been told she cries as easily as a crocodile. Another little girl was heard to say she would slit her sister's wisdom. A slip, no doubt, for wizen. And blast my lamps, and sink my timbers, are rolled profanely on the tongue. In every attic on the street, a raffish craft flies the skull and crossbones, and roves the Spanish main on rainy afternoons. Innocent victims, girls chiefly, who will tattle unless a horrid threat is laid upon them, are forced, blindfolded, to walk the plank. If the wind blows, scratching the trees against the roof, it is, by their desire, a tempest whirling their stout ship upon the rocks. What ho! We split! Mysterious chalkings mark the cellar stairs, and hint of treasure buried in the coal hole. At every mirror pirates practice their cruel faces. And now the daggers are complete, and their tip of blood has been squeezed from its twisted tube. Chests and neighbors have been rummaged for outlandish costumes. From the kindling pile a predestined stick has become the timber leg of the wicked duke. The butcher's hook has yielded to persuasion. Presently rehearsals will begin. I have been reading lately, and have come on a sentence with which I am in disagreement. I shall not tell the name of the book, mere mooglishness, but I hope you know it, or can guess. It is a tale of children, and of a runaway perambulator, and of folk who never quite grew up, with just a flick of inquiry, a slightest gesture now and then, towards precious rascals like our patch eye and the Duke. Its author stands, in my opinion, a better chance of our lasting memory than any writer living. If you have read this book, you have known in its author a man who is himself a child, one from whom the years have never taken toll, and if you have lingered from page to page, you know what humor is, and love, and gentleness. I think that children must have clambered on his familiar knee, and that he learned his plot from their trustful eyes. Someone has been reading my very copy of this book, for it is marked with pencil, and whole chapters have been thumbed. I would like to know who this reader is, a woman, beyond a doubt, who has dug in this fashion to the author's heart. But the book is from a lending library. She is only a number pasted inside the cover, a date that warns her against a fine. Her pencil has marked the words to a richer cadence. I like to think that she has children of her own, and that she read the book at twilight in the nursery, and that its mirth was shared from bed to bed. But the pathetic parts she did not read aloud fearing to see tears in her children's eyes. Before her own at times there must have floated a mist. She is a gracious creature, I am sure, with a gentleness that only a mother knows who sits with drowsy children. And now that it is my turn to read the book, for so does fancy urge me, I hear her voice and the echo of her children's laughter among the pages. It is a book about a great many things, about David and about a sausage machine, about a little dog which was supposed to have been caught up by mistake. But when the handle was reversed, out he came, whole and complete except that his bark was missing. A sausage still stuck to his tail, which presently he ate. And it proved to be his bark, for at the last bite of sausage his bark returned. And David took his salty handkerchief from his eyes and laughed. There is a chapter on growing old, marked in pencil, a subject which the author of this book knew nothing about, never having grown old himself. And there is another chapter about a spinster, also marked. This chapter sings with exquisite melody, but breaks once to a sob for a love that has been lost. But the book is chiefly about children. There is one particular sentence in this book with which I am not in agreement. 
down from the laughing avenues of childhood where memory tells us we run but once i cannot believe that i cannot believe we run but once in the heart of the man who wrote the book there lives a child and a child dwells in the heart of the woman of the lending library we are too ready to believe that childhood passes with the years that its fine imagination is blunted with the hard practice of the world too long have we been taught that the clouds of glory fade in the common day that the lofty castles of the morning perish in the noonday sun the magic vista is golden to the coming of the twilight and the sunset builds a gaudy tower that outtops the dawn if a man permits a child keeps house within his heart to the very end and therefore as i think of those whittled daggers with their spot of blood of that popping pistol of the captain's horrid hook of the black craft clawing the skull and crossbones in the attic i know despite appearance that i am young myself i snap my fingers at the clock it ticks merely for its own amusement i proclaim the calendar is false the sun rises and sets but makes no chilling notch upon the heart once again despite the weary signpost of the years i run on the laughing avenues of childhood my preface outstays its time even as i write our audience has gathered limber folk in front squat on the floor bearded folk behind perch on chairs as on a balcony already behind the scenes the captain of the pirates has assumed his hook and villainous attire patch eye mumbles his lines against a loss of memory paint has daubed him to a rascal the evil duke limps for practice on his timber leg presently our curtain will rise we shall see the pirate cabin with the lighthouse blinking in the distance the parrot flint's lantern and the ladder to the sleeping loft we shall hear a storm unparalleled like a tempest from the ocean hissed through the teeth we shall see the pirates in tattered costume and in pigtails made of stockings and now to bring this tedious explanation to a close permit me to hush our orchestra for a final word i have a most important announcement it is the sum and essence of all these pages this play of pirates doctored somewhat with fiercer oaths and lengthened for older actors this play and my other play of beggars i dedicate with my love to john abram florey who as red joe was the most frightful pirate of them all on choosing a title i find difficulty in selecting a name for my pirate play children seem so easy in comparison john or gretchen or gwendolen for parents of romantic taste gwendolen i myself dislike and i have thought i would give it to a cow if ever i owned a farm but this is prejudice to name a child i repeat one needs only to run his finger down the column of his acquaintance or think which aunt will have the looser purse strings in her will an unhappy choice after all is rare here and there a chocolate pearl or a dusky crinkle-headed blanche escapes our logic but who can think of a sullen nancy its very sound tossed about the nursery would brighten a maiden even if she were peevish at the start i once knew an excellent couple of the name of bottom who chose ruby as her offspring but i have no doubt that the infelicity was altered at the font the fact is that most of our names grow in time to fit our figure and our character margaret and helen sound thin or fat agreeable or dull as our friends and neighbors rise before us and any newcomer to our affection quickly erases the aspect of its former ugly tenant i confess that till lately a certain name brought to my fancy a bouncing red-armed creature but that by a change of lease upon our street it has acquired an alien grace and beauty perhaps a scrawny neighbor by the name of falstaff might remain inconsequent but i am sure that if a lady called messalina moved in next door and were of charming manner a month would blur the bad suggestion of her name which presently if our gardens ran together would come to sound sweetly in my ears but a play more than a child or neighbor is offered for a sudden judgment to sink or swim upon a first impression and its christening is an especial peril i have fretted for a month to find a title for my comedy my first choice was a frightful play of pirates in the word frightful lay the double meaning that i wanted it held up my hands as it were for mercy it is an old device did not keats when a novice in his art attempt by a modest preface to disarm the critics of his edimidian it is just he wrote that this youngster should die away yet my title was too long i could not hope if my comedy reached the boards 
that a manager could afford such a long display of electric lights above the door. It would require more than a barrel of lamps. The Pirates of Quobelli was not bad, except for length, but it was too obviously stolen from Gilbert's opera. I could feel my guilty fingers in his pocket. Sudeth was suggested, but it was too flippant, too farcical. Sublud, though effective in red lights, made the same objection. The Spitten Devil, named for our pirate ship, lacked refinement. Certainly no lady in silk and lace would admit acquaintance with so gross a personage. Darlin was offered to me, the name of the old lady with one tooth who cooks and mixes the grog for my sailormen. And I still think that with better spelling it would be an excellent title for musical comedy. But it was not for a pirate play. Its anemia would soften the vigor of my lines. One could as well call the tale of Bluebeard by the name of his casual cook. Then Clovelly seemed enough. At the very least, if my publisher were energetic, it ensured a brisk sale of the printed play among the American tourists on the Devon coast who traveled by boat or charabank to this ancient fishing village where we set our plot. For even a trivial book sells to trippers if its story is laid round the corner. Would it not be pleasant, I thought, when I visit the place again, to see them thumbing me as they waited for the steamer, to see a whole window of myself placed in equal prominence with picture postcards? When I registered at the inn alongside the wharf, I might not hope that the landlady would recognize my name and give me, as an honored guest, a front room that looks upon the ocean. Perhaps, as I had my tea and clotted cream on the village staircase, I might mention casually to a pretty tourist that I was the author of the book that protruded from her handbag, and fetch my dishes to her table. It is so seldom that an obscure author catches anyone flagrante delacto in his book. Will no one ever read a book of mine in the subway that I may tap him on the shoulder? Do travelers never put me in their grips? Must everyone read in public the latest novel and reserve all plays and essays for their solitary hours? At the club I shuffle to the top any periodical that contains my name, but the crowded noon buries me deep again. At best, maybe, in a lending library, I see a date stamped inside my cover, but, although I linger near the shelf, no one comes to draw me down. I think that hunters must look with equal hunger on the bear's tread. It is here! It is there! But the cunning creature has escaped. Blackmore's present ghost frequents the shadowy church at Porlock where he married Lorna and John Ridd, or roams the valley of the rocks to see the studious pilgrims at his pages. Stevenson haunts the gloomy inlet where the Admiral Benbow stood, and where old Pew came tapping in the night. In the flesh I shall join their rebels as an equal comrade. Clovelly, however, although its lilt was pleasant to the ear, was an insufficient title. Skull and Crossbones was too obvious, and my next choice was The Gibbet. But there was a disadvantage of scaring the timid. Old ladies would pass me by. It would check the sale of tickets. My nephew, who was fourteen and not at all timid, was stout in his defense. He pronounces it as if the G were the hard kind that starts off gurgle. Give it. He asked me if I had a hanging in the piece. If so, he knew how the business could be managed without chance of accident, an extra rope fastened to the belt behind. I told him that it was none of his business how I ended up the pirates. I would hang them, or not, as I saw fit. He would have to pay his quarter like everyone else, and sit it through. He suggested, from dishpan to matrimony, obviously a jest. The sly rogue laughs at me. I must confess, however, that he has given me some of my best lines. Villainies afoot, for example, and sink me stern up. His peaceful school breeds a wealth of pungent English. I was in despair. Revenge! Would that have done? I see a maddened father stand, with smoking revolver, above the body of a silky-whiskered villain. Doris! the panting parent cries. The butcher boy knows all, and wants you for his bride! and down comes the happy curtain on the lovers. The Wreckers belongs to Stevenson. The Pirate's Nest. It is too ornithological. The Natural History Museum might buy a copy and think I had cheated them. And then, Channel Lights. It sends us sharply to the days of the older melodrama, days when we exchanged a ten-cent piece for a gallery seat and hissed the villain. Do you recall the breathless moment when the heroine employed the villain to give her back her stolen child? For answer the cruel fellow tied the darling to the buzz-saw, or that darker scene when he tossed the lady to the black waters of the Thames with the splash of a dipper up behind. Hurry, master hero, your horse's hoofs clatter in the wings. Gallop, Dobbin, a precious life depends upon your speed. 
our dangerous plot hangs by a single thread. It is quite a task to find a sufficient title. I have wavered for a month. But now my efforts seem rewarded. There is a wharf in London below the tower, not far from the India docks. It is now sunk to common weekday uses, and I suppose its rotten timbers are piled with honest, unromantic merchandise. But once pirates were hanged there. It was the first convenient place for inbound ships to dispose of this dirty deep-sea cargo. Doubtless hereabout, the lanes and building tops were crowded with an idle throng as on a holiday, and wearies to the bank side, and the play paused with suspended oar for a sight of the happy festival. Did Hamlet wait upon this ghastly prologue? Shakespeare himself, unplayed script in hand, mused how tragedy and farce go hand in hand. In those golden days with which our comedy concerns itself, a gibbet stood on Wapping Wharf, and pirates stepped off the fatal cart to a hangman's jest. We may hear the shouts of the prentice lads echoing across the centuries. I cannot hope that many persons, except dusty scholars, will know of the district's ancient ill repute. Yet Wapping Wharf figures often in my dialogue as the sombre motif of a pirate's life. It conveys to the plot a sense of mystery. It needs but a handful of electric lamps. If no one offered me a better title, I shall let it stand. End of Introduction Act One of Warpen Wharf, A Frightful Comedy of Pirates by Charles S. Brooks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Wapin Wharf, A Frightful Comedy of Pirates. Act One. Our scene is the wind-swept coast of Devon. By day there is a wide stretch of ocean far below. The time is remote, and doubtless great ships of forgotten build stand out from Bristol in full sail for western shores. Their white canvas wings in the morning sun as if their purpose were a jest. They seek a northwest passage and the golden mines of India. But we must be loose and free of date, lest our plot be shamed by broken fact. A thousand years are but as yesterday. We shall make no more than a general gesture toward the wide spaces of the past. The village of Clovelly climbs in a single street, a staircase really, from the shore to the top of the cliff, and is fagged and out of breath halfway. But on a still dizzier crag, storm-blown, clinging by its toes, there stands the pirate's cabin. To this topmost ledge, fishwives sometimes scramble by day to seek a belated sail against lundy's isle but after twilight a night wind searches the crannies of the rock and winds to the moon of its barren quest and then no villager i think chooses to walk in that direction i have visited clovelly and have kicked a sodden donkey from the wharf to the top of the street past the shops of devon cream and picture postal cards but have sought in vain the pirate's cabin since our far-off adventure of to-night ten thousand tempests have snarled across these giddy cliffs and we must convince our reason that these highest crags where we pitch our plot have long since been toppled in a storm where yonder wave leathers the shaggy headland as if neptune had turned barber we must fancy that the pinnacles of yesteryear lie buried in the sea we had hoped for a play upon the sea with a tall mast rocking from wing to wing and the tempest roaring at the rail alas our pirates grow old and stiff they have retired as we say from active practice and live in idle luxury on shore yet we shall see that their villainy still thrives our scene is their cabin on the cliff it is a rough stone building with peeling plaster and slates that by day are green with moss but it is night and the wind is whistling its rowdy companions from the sea until the morning they will play at leapfrog from cliff to cliff far below is the village of clovelly snug with fire and candles we enter the cabin without knocking like neighbors through a garden and poke about a bit before our hosts appear 
a door forward at the right leads to the kitchen backstage also at the right a ladder rises to a sleeping loft on the left wall are a chimney and fireplace with a crane and pot for heating grog and smoky timbers above to mark the frequent thirst on a great beam overhead are bags of clinking loot and shining brasses from wrecked ships peppers hang to dry before the fire and the lighted ship's lantern swings from a hook at the rear of the cabin to the left a row of mullioned windows looks at sea and cliffs in a flash of lightning below is a seaman's chest above on the broken plaster is scrawled the ship in the middle at the rear there is a clock with hanging pendulum and weights a gun of antique pattern leans beside the clock to the right the cabin is recessed with a door right angled in the jog and other windows looking on the sea a parrot sits on its perch with curbed profanity the gaudy creature is best if stuffed for its noisy tongue would drown our dialogue like hamlet's player it would speak beyond its lines and raise a quantity of barren laughter our furniture is a table and three stools and a tall backed chair beside the hearth on the table a candle burns bespattered with tallow the cabin glows with firelight at the lifting of the curtain there is thunder and lightning and a rush of wind if it can be managed two pirates are discovered drinking at the table by the smack of their lips it is excellent grog one of them patch eye has lost an eye and he wears a black patch his hair curls up in a pigtail like any sailor before nelson it looks as stiff as a hook and he might almost be lifted by it and hung on a peg but all of our pirates wear pigtails except one red joe the other pirate at the table is called the duke for no apparent reason as he is a shabby rogue we must not run our finger down the peerage in hope of finding him or think that he owns a palace on the strand he has only one leg with a timber below the knee he wears a long cloak so that the actor's rusticated leg can be folded out of sight the duke has a great red nose grog and rum and that sort of thing his whiskers are the bush that marks the merry drinking place patch eye is melancholy almost sentimental at times he would stab a man but grieve upon a sparrow at heart we fear he is a coward and stupid the duke on the contrary is shrewd and he does a lot of thinking he has heavy eyebrows he is the kind of thinker that you just know that he is thinking both pirates are very cruel and profane but we must be careful and now we hush the melancholy fiddlers if this comedy can stir the croaking bass viol to any show of mirth our work tops falstaff glum folk with beards had best withdraw only the young in heart will catch the slender meaning of our play let's light the candles and draw the curtain darlin darlin he lolls back in his chair and stretches out his legs for comfort darlin at this a dirty old woman with one tooth appears from the kitchen she is called darlin just for fun as she is not at all kissable a sprig of mistletoe even in the christmas season would beckon vainly me friend the duke is thirsty will you fill the cups hurry old dear and squeeze in just a little bit of lemon it sets the stomach you sets your stomach like it were hen's eggs always coddling it she stirs and tastes the pot of grog and hoists her wrinkled stockings are there's no one like darlin for mixin grog for that kind word i'm lovin you she looks at him with admiration ain't he a figure of a man venus was nothin just nothin at all the grog beats off the melancholy as soon as me pipes go dry i gets homesick for the ocean here we be duke thrown up at last to rot like driftwood on the shore 
no more sailing off to trinidad no tackin round the hebrides we as ships as has sprung a leak eh, it was happy days when we sailed off old flint on the spanish main happy days patch they drink ay the blessed dear old roaring hulk uh, no better private ever lived than flint smart with his cutlass quick at the trigger grog a sloppin' pella it was just a sip oh, i used to tell him that his leg was holler he was a vat was flint just a swishin keg grog just sizzled and disappeared like when you drops it on a red-hot sea coal for twenty year or more me and you has seen old flint march his victims off the plank our step lively you'd say doesn't ye hear davy callin to ye ere was never a sail a man ever sat in the port light at wappin wharf could drink with flint wappin wharf and gibbets is nothing to talk about funerals even is cheerfuller Here's his parrot. She used to cuss soft and gentle to herself, happy all the day. She ain't spoke since Flint's was took, pecking at your fingers and brooding. There's his old clock. As hung in the cabin of old Spitten Devil. With the pendulum getting tangled in a storm. An ell of a clock for a bouncing ship. She was tickin' peaceful the day Flint was hanged. But she stopped. Does you remember it? The very minute they pushed him off the ladder. She ain't ticked since. It makes you stitious. And she won't never run again. That's what Flint allers said. Till to his death's revenge. He told us never to wind her, says she'd start herself with no winding when the right time came. If I was to look up and see that pendulum swinging, horrors, yellow elephants would be nothing. Puh, I'd give a month of grog just to hear the old dear tickin, and to know that Flint was restin' easy in his rotten coffin. Swappin' stories with the pretty angels. Oh, I, I love Flint like a brother. He is quite sentimental about this. It was him knocked this out. Pointing to his missing eye. But it was just in the way of business. We differed a little in the loot. He was very persuasive, was old Flint. Oh, you talks like a woman. I loves you to cuff em. Em was happy days, Patch. Bless me, Gig, what's left, Duke? But me and you has seen a heap of sights. I suppose I've drowned myself a hundred men. It's comfortin when you're lays awake at night. I feel as I ain't wasted myself. I've used my gifts. I ain't been a foolish virgin and put me shining talent inside a bushel. But me and you is driftwood now, Duke. Oi, but it's no use sniffling about an old crocodile. Darling is certainly handy at mixin' grog, and we've a right smart cabin with winders on the sea. Since I stuffed your old shirt in the roof, it hardly leaks. My shirt. Next week is me week for changing. How would you have done it? I am a kinder particular dresser. I likes to wash now and then, if it ain't too often. Darling, me friend Patch is thirsty, and I drop meself. The cups are filled. You're a precious old lady, and I loves ya. Ye spoils me, Duke. Lightning and a crash of thunder. It's foul tonight on the ocean. 
how the wind blows it be splitting up outside the channel's as roiled as a vampire when you scorns her how she snorts the devil hisself is hissing through his teeth there'll be sailormen to-night what's booked for davy jones's locker i'm not kicking much or to be ashore i rots peaceful patch eye has opened the door to consult the night it slams wide in the wind and the gust blows out the candle hey there forward batten your hatch you're blowing the gizzard out of us he hobbles on timber leg to the warm chair by the fire patch closes the door and sits darlin relights the candle poor flint who was took on just such a night dropped into the port light for something wet and warmin just to kinder say good-bye ship all fitted out he got three new sailor men fine fellers as had been sentenced to be hanged for cuttin purses but had been let go as they had reformed and wanted to be honest pirates i remembers the night old sea nymph it was rainin to put out the fires of hell with a little devil stokin in the sinners it's sinners patch as is used for kindlers to keep the devils in an healthy sweat he was to sail when the tide ran out lord a goody how the tide runs down the thames as if it were homesick for the ocean but someone squealed squealers is worse than hissin reptiles they catched flint and they strung him to a gibbet poor old dear i never touches me patch but thinks of flint this ere life is snug and easy we has retired from practice like storekeepers does who has made a fortune ain't we settin here in style and comfort and just waitin for the treasure ships to come to us we gets the plums without chewin at the dough we blows out the lighthouse and we sets our lanterns so as to fool em on the course and when they smashes on the rocks well all we does is stuff our pokes with the treasure that washes up i praise meself for fog and dirty weather now i lay me says i and will you send it thick and oozy i ain't disputing you he cheers up a bit and we robs landlubbers once in a while now you're talking old sea lion i'm telling you it were a good all we made last night on castle crag who's disputing you Arr, i'm telling you silver candles and spoons never seen such a heap of spoons what's any one want more than one spoon for you cleans it every bite again the tongue Arr, you disgusts me patch you ain't no manners for meself i spears me food tidy on me knife the duke sits looking at the seaman's chest at the rear of the cabin he is deep in thought now there's just one little thing i doesn't understand i asks you he goes to the chest opens it and draws out a rich velvet garment he holds it up what's the meaning of this ere loot we took at castle crag i asks you ain't we been by that castle a hundred times the earl he don't wear clothes like this none of the aristocracy does except when they struts on piccadilly i ask you patch i asks you who wears a thing like that he puts the garment around patch's shoulders you looks like the archbishop of canterbury patch with strut and gesture his grease taking the air fucking posies 
looking like a silly jackass. You hurt me feelings, Duke. The Duke folds the cloak and puts it back again in the chest. He sits at the table in meditation. Oh, it doesn't like it, Patch. I doesn't understand it. And what I doesn't understand, I doesn't like. What? Them gay clothes. Who owned them? I asks you afore we stole them. Darling, me friend the Duke is thirsty. You had better mix another pot. Our cups is low. You doesn't want to be a foolish virgin and get catched without no grog. With this bit of slop what's left, I drinks to your shining lamps. Weenus's flashing gigs. I loves you, Duke. She fills, mixes, and stirs the pot. She tastes it like a practised housewife. Her apron is made of all work. It is towel, dust rag, mop, and handkerchief. What does you make, old Cyclops, of the new recruit? Red Joe? Him. He's a right smart pirate, I says. I never seen a feller as could shoot so straight. Oh, I says so. But he's a wee bit knobby. Kind of stiff in the nose. Looks as if he knowed he was kinder good. It's queer how he come to us. Just sitting on top his dory on the beach when we found him. And what he said about his ship going down. Blast me old stump, but it were queer. Queer? You said it, Patch. Queerer than mermaids. Did we ever see a stick of that ship? I'm asking you, Patch. Ain't I listening? Ain't I telling you? Nary a bit washed in. Did you ever know a wreck long here where nothing washed in? Just nothing? I'm asking you. You and me would starve if it happened regular. It's what we lives by. Pickens on the beach. He's a right smart pirate, Red Joe. The captain, the most particular man I know, he took to him at once. He's a kind of good-looking fellow. Darlin, stirring at the pot. He ain't got whiskers like the Duke. She spits. Must I say it? She spits into the fire. Queer that never a stick washed in. No, I'm not denying your duke. Where's Red Joe now? It's getting on. I'll just take a look for him. He takes the lantern from its hook and stands at the open door. It ain't blown so hard. Old Borealis, I speaks poetical. Ain't straining at his waistcoat buttons like he was. Ignorance, I oh, pities ya. Borealis ain't wind, he's rain buys. Patch Eye goes into the night. The Duke sits to a greasy game of solitaire. It's queer, I says. Nary a stick, just red joe on top his dory. He sings abstractedly. Bill Bones used to say on many a day, when taking a ship for its loot, that a blow on the head was quick as dead, and safest and best to boot. But a victim's end for meself, I contend, there's a hundred been killed by me, is a walk, I'll be frank, on a slippery plank, and a splash in the roaring sea. He turns and surveys the drawing above the windows. He cocks his head like a connoisseur, critically, with approval. I'm the artist of that there masterpiece, the spitting devil. I done it on a rainy morning. Genius is queer. Then he sings again. Old Pew had a jerk with a long-handed dirk. His choice was a jab in the dark. He is engaged thus, fumbling with his cards, when Darlin, 
crossing from the fire interrupts him duke will you have a nip of grog it eases your pipes you sounds as if you had crumbs in your gullet the duke pushes forward his cup it's a lovely gin and i wrote it meself he continues his song old pew had a jerk with a long-handed dirk his choice was a jab in the dark and morgan's crew twixt me and you considered a rope a lark but a prettier end i repeat and contend and i've sailed on every sea is a plunge off the side in the foam and tide it tickles a sailor like me duke does you happen to have a wife duke deeply engaged some chins is hard so i just makes em up as i goes along black beard had a knife which he stuck in his wife for nagin says he to me has your wife a wife as might turn up i mean say it again darlin most sailors has wives of course strewed here and there from bristol to guinea just to make all ports cosy so as you're going home to a happy family no matter where you steers it's comfortable darlin i'll not deny it when you heads to harbour to see a winkin candle in a window on a hill and knows that a faithful wife and a couple of little pirates is waitin to hug ye i says so duke i've been a wife myself on and off with husband sailin in and out kissin you and hoistin sail round about i says makes happy marriages has your wife duke livin as you can remember you're a bold forward creature are you proposin to me something like a wink shows in the blush i blush for your bad manners duke i'm a lady and i waits patient for the happy question i lets me beauty do the pleading i was a flamin' roarer in me time lovers was nothin dozens there was a sea captain once she smiles dreamily then seems to cut her throat with her little finger positive just cause we tiffed and a stagecoach driver i had to cool his passion with a rolling pin he brooded himself into drink happy days she is lost for a moment in her glorious past then blows her nose upon her apron and returns to us duke asking your pardon i was noticing lately that you was casting your eyes on little betsy as washes the dishes her go along and a thought you might be drawn to her darlin i'm easy roiled you can have her duke on one condition she's a pretty little girl you must set me up in a pub in bristol with brass beer poles i'll not deny i've given her a thought usual wives is nuisances nagging at you for sixpences but sometimes i does get lonesome on a wet night when there nothin to do i need someone to hand me down me boots betsy ud make a kind of cosy wife could yer learn her to make grog Aye i might do worse than roast pig that crackles i could learn her i might do worse sir i'd marry you darlin dearie but you're gettin on patch might marry her he's only got one eye patch i'll not deny i've been considerin little betsy i was thinkin about it this mornin as i was cleanin me boot wives cleans boots i'm the sort of sailorman 
she would be sure to like and what about the pub blast me stump darlin i'll not forget ya does i get brass beer pools in the tap everything shiny i'm lovin ya betsy would kind of jump at me there's something tender about a young girl's first love cooing in your arms easy duke i always was a favorite with the ladies i think it's me whiskers that's there duke there's a shoal ahead red joe's a right smart feller red joe him he sits and watches her what can she see in a young fella like that women's queer folks they're vicious vampires just you watch em together red joe's snoopin in on you you can blast me he ain't got whiskers i'm tellin you duke if i was you i'd tumble that red joe off a cliff i'm hintin to you duke off a cliff <laughs> it's the pig i clean forgot the pig it's burning on the fire off a cliff i'm hinting to you she runs to the kitchen red joe women's queer queerer than mermaids a snooper just a prentice pirate no whiskers nothing at this moment there is a stamping of feet outside and patch eye enters with red joe if red joe were born a gentleman we might expect silver buckles and a yellow feather to trail across his shoulder for he bears a jaunty dignity his is a careless grace the swagger of a pleasant vagabond a bravado that snaps its fingers at danger his body has the quickness of a cat his eye a flash of humour kindly unless necessity sharpens it as poets were thick in those golden days we suspect that the roar of the ocean sets rhymes jingling in his heart he is however almost as shabby as the other pirates although he wears no pigtail his collar is turned up he wrings the water from his head patch eye throws himself on the seaman's chest and falls asleep at once he snores an obligato to our scene just once an ugly dream disturbs him and we must fancy that a gibbet has crossed the frightful shadow of his thoughts even an old sea serpent where's ye been up at the lighthouse it says it's murky as hell's back door see petey i did it was puttering with his light and meowing to his tabby cat we're a blessin to old petey i'm bettin me stump he'd get lonesome up there sip for us he points to the window to the right where the lighthouse shows there's old petey starin at the ocean you ain't never seen a light at that other window has ye joe we waits for a merchant man which he knows has gold aboard then we just tips a hint to petey and he douses his light then we sets up our lantern old flint's lantern outside on the rocks just where she shows the t'other window the ship sticks her nose agin the cliff smash at this point after a few moments of convulsion patch eye falls off the chest he sits up and rubs his eyes oh i dreamed of gibbets you're as lucky old kegarum you doesn't dream of purple rhinoceroses go back to bed then to joe smash i says on comes petey again and we just as innocent as babes in a crib it was me own idea brains young fellow just ye wait joey till ye sees a light at the other window betsy is heard singing in the kitchen 
the duke stops and listens a dark thought runs through his head his shrewd eye quests from the kitchen door to joe darlin darlin she thrusts in her head where's betsy she's washing dishes i'm wondering if she would lay off a bit from her jolly occupation and sing us a little song betsy i want you i never knowed yer cared for music duke usually yer goes outside you're just booze i does usual patch tonight's particular red joe ain't heard betsy sing does yer like music joe i like the roaring of the ocean i like to hear the trees tossing in the wind wind ain't music you should hear betsy she's got a little song that makes you feel as good and peaceful as a whining parson darlin beckoning at the kitchen door betsy stop slapping with the dishes betsy enters she is a pretty girl our guess at her age is but it is better not to guess we have in our own experience made several humiliating blunders let us say that betsy is young enough to be a granddaughter plainly she is a pirate by accident not inheritance for she is clean and she wears a pretty dress duke as he rises and makes a show of manners betsy yes welcome to the parlour we wants red joe to hear you sing that little song of yours he returns to the recess at the rear of the cabin and covertly watches joe patch eye is lost in heavenly meditation joe's attention is roused before the first stanza of the song is finished by the third stanza betsy sings to him alone the north wind's cheeks are puffed with tunes it whistles across the sky its song is shrill and rough until the hour of twilight's nigh rest my dear one rest and dream the winds on tiptoe keep in the dusk of day they hum their lay and weary children sleep the waves since dawn roared on the rocks they snarled at the ships on the deep but at twilight hour they chain their power and little children sleep rest my dear one rest and dream the ships in a cradle swing and sailormen blink and children sink to sleep as the wavelets sing the sun at noon was red and hot it stifled the east and west but at even song the shadows long have summoned the world to rest rest my dear one rest and dream the sun runs off from the sky but the stars it's odd while children nod are tuned to a lullaby she sings slowly to a measure that might rock a cradle this can be managed for i have tried it with a chair once patch eye blows his nose to keep his emotions from exposure but make him blow softly sotto naso shall we say so as not to disturb the song in red joe the song seems to have stirred a memory at the end of each stanza betsy pauses as if she too dwelt in the past when i hears that song i feel as if i were rockin babies in a crib bless little pirates pullin at their bottles as well foller the sea some day he blows his sentimental nose a slighter structure would burst in the explosion your old nose sounds as if it were tootin for a fog you might be round in the isle of dogs on a murky night he goes to the door and stretches out his hand for raindrops joe you and me has to put oil in the lantern come on old sweetheart when you sees this lantern blinkin at that there window you will know that willany's afoot he comes close to darlin and whispers you said it darlin you said it red joe's castin his eye on 
Betsy, off a cliff. Tonight, now, if I gets a chance, off a cliff. Come on, Joey. He goes outdoors with Red Joe, singing Betsy's song. The lullaby fades in the distance. Patch Eye and Betsy are left together, for the roast pig again calls Stalin to the kitchen. Will ye wait a bit, Betsy? Ask you your pardon while I talk to you? Of course, Patch. I don't suppose, dearie. I'm the kind of pirate that sets you thinking of fiddles tuning up near parsons. No, you says nur cradles and lethal devils biting at their quarrel. I don't suppose you has a kind of a hankering and yearning. You never sets and listens to me coming. Oh, of course not, you says, Betsy. If I talk out square, you'll not blab it all around the village, will you? They would point their fingers at me and <laughs> giggle in their sleeves. I want to tell you something a very tender nature. There's a lethal word as begins with L. L, I mean not tell. I wouldn't want you to think, Betsy. I, I'm a cousin. L is cousin. The little word is what's ailing me. It's love, Betsy. It's me heart. Smashed altered bits. Jesus, you ask, what done it? It's a pretty girl, I answer you, as I smashed it. Does your follow, Betsy? A pretty girl about your size, and with eyes the color yorn. What does your say, Betsy? Your says nothing. I never meant to, Patch. I'm sorry. Of course you are. Just as sorry as the careless feller is nudged Humpty Dumpty off the wall. But it didn't do no good. There he was, broke all to flinders. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't fix him. Humpty Dumpty is me, Betsy. Regularly all split up, fore and aft, rib and keel. I mopes for you all day, Betsy, and I mopes all night. Last night I didn't get her sleep, just fidgeting till way past eleven o'clock, and I woke again at seven, asking myself if I loves you hopeless. You're as a lump of sugar, Betsy, as would sweeten old Patch's life. If we was married, I just tag round behind you and hand your things, and now you tells me there ain't no hope at all. No hope at all, Patch. Yesterday, I was counting the potatoes in the pot, saying to myself, She loves me. She don't love me. But the last potato didn't love me, Betsy. There was just one too many potatoes in the pot. No, you says, you couldn't love me. Cause why? Cause Patch is a shabby pirate with only one eye. I am sorry, Patch. She offers him her hand. Flesh little fingers as twines their cells all round me heart. Patch. You says you're sorry. There ain't no hope at all. You nudges him off the wall, but you can't fix him. But I never heard that Humpty Dumpty did a lot of squealing when he bust. He took it like a pirate, and so does Patch. I doesn't sulk. If you will pardon me, Betsy, I'll leave you. Me feelings get lumpy in me throat. I'll take a wink of sleep in the loft. He climbs the ladder, but turns at the top. There was just one too many potatoes in the pot. He disappears through the hole in the wall. Betsy arranges the mugs on the table, then stands listening. Presently there is a sound of footsteps. 
Red Joe enters at the rear. I slipped the duke in the dark. Oh, I came back to talk with you. Then bluntly, but with kindness. How old are you, my dear? I don't know. You don't know? How long have you lived here? In this cabin, three years. And where did you live before? In the village, in Clovelly. Did your parents live there? Yes, I think so. I don't know. Old Nancy, they called her. She brought me up. But she died three years ago. Who was old Nancy? She did washing for the sailormen. Was she good to you? Oh, yes. I think, I do not know, that she was not my mother. And darling? Yes, she has been good to me. And the others, too. I seem to remember someone else. How long have you been a pirate? A pirate? Years, it seems, my dear. But I am more used to a soldier's oath. I have trailed a pike in the lowland wars. The roar of cannon and siege and falling walls are gayer tunes than any ocean tempest. What is this that you remember, Betsy? It is far off. Someone saying to me, it was not Nancy. When Nancy died, Darlin took me and brought me up. That was three years ago. But last year the captain and Duke and Patchai came climbing up the rocks. They were sailormen, they said, who had lost a ship. And these cliffs with the sea pounding on the shore comforted them when they were lonely. So they stayed, and Darlin and I cook for them. Do you remember who it was who sang to you? No. That song you just sang. Where did you learn it? I have always known it. It makes me sad to sing it, for it sets me thinking. Thinking of something that I have forgotten. She stands at the window above the sea. Some days I climb high on the cliffs, and I look upon the ocean. And I know that there is land beyond, where children play. But I see nothing but a rim of water. And sometimes the wind comes off the sea, and it brings me familiar, far-off voices. Voices I once knew. Voices I once knew. Fragments from a life I have forgotten. Why do you ask about my song? Because I heard it once myself. Betsy sits beside him at the table. <gasps> Where? Perhaps, if you will tell me, it will help me to remember. I heard the song once when I was a lad. But I was taken on a visit. Were your parents pirates? It was a long journey, and all day we bumped upon the road, seeking an outlet from the tangled hills. Night overtook our weary horses, and blew out the flaming candles in the west. The shadows were a blanket on the sleeping world. Toward midnight I was roused. We had come to the courtyard of a house. This house where I was taken on a visit. Was it like this, Joe? A cabin on a cliff? I remember how the moon peeped around the corner to see who came so late knocking on the door. I remember. I remember. He stops abruptly. Do you remember when you first came to live with Nancy? I dreamed once. You will think me silly. Are there great stone steps somewhere? Wider than this room, with marble women standing motionless, and walls with dizzy towers upon them? Go on, Betsy. In Clovelly there are not but cabins pitched upon a hill, and ladders to a loft, and at the foot of the town a mole where boats put in. And I have listened to the songs of the fishermen as they wind their nets, and through the window of the tavern I have heard them singing at their rum, and sometimes I have been afraid. I have stuffed my ears and ran. But the ugly songs have followed me and scared me in the night. The shadows from the moon have reeled across the floor, like a tipsy sailor from the harbor light. Joe, are you really a man from the sea? Why, Betsy? The sea is never gentle. It never sleeps. I have stood listening at the window on breathless nights, but the ocean always slaps against the rocks. Even in a calm it moves and frets. Is it not said that the ghosts of evil men walk back and forth on the spot where their crimes are done? The ocean, perhaps, for its cruel wreckage, haunts these cliffs. It is doomed through all eternity with a lather of breaking waves to wash these rocks of blood, and the wind whistles to bury the cries of drowning men that plague the memory. Joe! 
Yes, my dear. You are the only one, Patch Eye, Duke, and the Captain. You are the only one who is always gentle. And I have wondered if you could really be a pirate. Me. Then, with sudden change. Me. General. The devil himself is my softer twin. Don't. Don't. What do you know of scuttled ships and rascals ripped in fight? Of the last bubbles that grin upon the surface when a dozen men have drowned? Joe, for God's sake, don't. Is it journalist to plunge a dagger in a man and watch for his dying eye to glaze? It is a lie. Tell me it is a lie. My dear. Gently he touches her hand. It is a lie. We'll pretend it is a lie. They sit for a moment without speaking. How long, Joe, have you lived with us? Two weeks, Betsy. Two weeks? So short a time. From Monday to Monday, and then around again to Monday. It is so brief a space that a flower would scarcely droop and wither. And yet the day you came seems already long ago. And all the days before are of a different life. It was another Betsy, not myself, who lived in this cabin on a Sunday before a Monday. It is so always, Betsy, when friends suddenly come to know each other. All other days sink to unreality like the memory of snow upon a day of August. We wonder how the flowering meadows were once a field of white. Our past selves, Betsy, walk apart from us, and, uh, Although we know their trick of attitude and the fashion of their clothes, they are not ourselves. We're friendship, and it grips the heart. We winds the fibers of our being. Do you remember, dear, how you ran fright when you first saw me clambering up these rocks? I was sent to call the Duke to dinner, and carried a bell to ring it on the cliff. I was afraid when a stranger's head appeared upon the path. Yet when I spoke, you stopped. At the first word I knew I needn't be afraid, and you took my hand to help me up the slope. You asked my name, and told me yours was Joe. Then we came together to this cabin, and each day I have been with you. Two weeks only. I shall be gone, Betsy, in a little while. Gone? I am not, my dear, the master of myself. We must forget these days together. Joe. Maybe I shall return. Fate is captain. The future shows so vaguely in the mist. Ah, listen. It is the Duke. In the distance, the Duke is heard singing the pirate song. We must speak of these things together. Another time when there is no interruption. Gently she touches his fingers. I shall be lonely when you go. There is loud stamping at the door. Betsy goes quickly to the kitchen. The captain enters, followed by the duke. Patch Eye enters by way of the ladder. The captain has a hook hand. This is the very hook mentioned in my preface, if you read prefaces, got from the corner butcher. The captain would be a frightful man to meet socially. I can hear a host saying, shake hands with the captain. One quite loses his taste for dinner parties. There is a sabre cut across the captain's cheek. He is even more disreputable in appearance than his followers, with a bluster that marks his rank. There's news! There's news, my men! I've brought big news from the village. He wrings the water from his head. He is provokingly deliberate. All of the pirates crowd around. By the bones of me, ten fingers, it's a blithe night for our business. It's wetter than a crocodile's nest. When I smells of fog, I feels good. I tastes it and is happy. What's your news, Captain? News? Oh, yes, the news. I've just heard... I've just heard... Oh, blast me, rotten timbers. How can a man talk when he's dry? A cup of grog. Darlin has slipped into the room in the excitement. Old custom anticipates his desire. She stands at his elbow with the cup like a dirty Ganymede. The captain drinks slowly. There's big news, me Aries. Er, what's your news, captain? We asks you. I'm telling her. It's sweating with curiosity that kills cats. He yawns and stretches his legs across the hob. 
Ugh. Down in the village, I learnt. I was just taking a drop of rum at the harbour light. It's not as sweet as darlings. They skimps their sugar. Yer wants to keep dropping it in as yer stirs it. I thinks they puts in too much water. Water's not much good. Except for washing. And uh, washing's not much good. Now then, Captain, hold hard on your tiller again, wobbling, and get to port. We're hanging on your lips. You're needin' to keep shoving me. I kicks up when I'm riled. They say down in the village. It is now a sneeze that will not dislodge. He has hopes of it for a breathless moment, but it proves to be a dud. There's P. We're just fidgeting for the news. The news? Oh, yes. Now you hears it. He draws the pirates near. A great merchantsman has just sailed from Bristol. The Royal Arry. It's her. With gold for the armies in France. She's a brig of five hundred ton. This night, when the tide runs out, she slips away from Bristol Harbour. With this wind, she should be off Cloverley by this time tomorrow night. Glory to God. And then Petey will douse his glim. And we'll set up the ship's lantern. Smash. Then Petey will light himself. And we'll be just as innocent as babies rockin' in a crib. And lay it on the helmsman for being sleepy. And I've other news. Down in the village, they say, for a fishin' soup brought the word. That his Highness, the Prince of Wales, left London a month ago. And him not giving me word? I oh, calls that shabby. He was me fag at eatin'. Does your think, Captain, he'll spend a weekend with us riding to the hounds, just tellin' us the London gossip? How pretty the Duchess is cuttin' up? I thought he was sittin' in Whitehall, tryin' on crowns so as to get one that didn't scratch his ears they say he's incarnito what is it something your catches like wally gogs in the stomach ignorance i'm shamed of you patch ain't you been to school ain't you done lessons on a slate ain't you been walloped so standin's been comfortabler the captain and me soils ourselves talking to you. Incarnito is dressed up fancy so as no one can know him. Like Cinderella at the party. If you wants patch to understand you, captain, you's got to use little words as is still pulling at their bottles. When words grow big and has got beards. They just don't say nothing to Patch. This here Prince of Wales is journeying down Plymouth Way. What's that to us? I'm asking you. His highness cut me when I passed him in Piccadilly. A bloomin' swab. I pulled me at, standing in the gutter, but he just seemed to smell something. It weren't roses, I'm telling you. Silence! They say he has sworn an oath to break up the pirate business on the coast. And let us starve? It's unfeeling. No pickings on the beach? I'd like to catch him. I'd slit his whistle. I'd put poison in the pig I feeds him. I'd nudge him off the cliff, just like he were a sneaking snooper. Well, there is your news. I'm dry. Darling? Some grog. He crosses to the table and draws the pirates around him. Here's the royal Harry. And may the helmsman be very sleepy. And we as innocent as little pirates sucking at their bottles. The royal Harry. While the cups are still aloft, there is a loud banging at the door. An old woman enters. Old Meg. We have seen her but a minute since past the windows. Perhaps she is as dirty as Darlin. A sprig of mistletoe, even at the reckless new year, would wither in despair. 
she is a gypsy in gorgeous skirt and shawl and she wears gold earrings any well-instructed nursemaid would huddle her children close if she heard her tapping up the street meg walks to the table she sniffs audibly it is grog her weakness she drinks the dregs of all three cups she rubs her thrifty finger inside the rims and licks it for the precious drop she opens her wallet and takes from it a fortune teller's crystal i tell fortunes gentlemen wouldn't any o you like to see the future i sees what's comin in this here magic glass i tells you when to set your nets and have rising storms as any o you a kind o hankerin for matrimony i can tell you if the lady be light or dark it'll cost you only a sixpence you insults me for better and for worse as usual for worse does you think you can anchor an old sea dog like me to a kennel as is made for landlubbery lap dogs i've deserted three wives and that's enough more's a hog he retires to the fireplace in disgust husbands is nuisances as i was telling the sea captain just before i cut his throat thank you old lady i doesn't need you when the old duke is willin he knows a little dear as will come flutterin to his arms what can you do for an old sailor man like me i'd like someone with curlin locks says can mix grog as good as darlin's and i likes roast pig crackly as darlin cooks it he offers his hand i has a leetle girl in mind and she's kinder holdin up what does your see dearie does you hear any fiddles tunin for the nuptials is there a pretty lady waitin for a kiss i sees the ocean and a ship i sees inside the cabin of that ship does you see me as the captain of the ship just settin easy brawlin orders just feedin on plum duff i sees you're in irons mother o oh goodness now you've done it i sees wapping wharf i sees a gibbet i sees horrors i sees you swinging on that gibbet stretching with your toes swinging in the wind you makes me grog sour on me he goes to the rear of the cabin and looks disconsolately over the ocean meg as she looks in the glass i sees misfortune for everyone here except one tragedy the gibbet go not upon the sea until the moon has turned ha little glass has you more to show has you any comfort the light fades out it is dark ain't you givin us more than sixpence worth of misery your gloom is sloppin over the brim ah here's light again at last there's a red streak across the dial it drips it's blood ain't you got any pretty pictures in that glass graveyards are cheerful and gibbets peace i sees a man in a velvet cloak it's him that swings you to a gibbet it's him that strangles you till your eyes is poppin that man avoid like a poison snake avoid by the rotten bones of flint if i meet that man in a velvet cloak i hooks out his eye captain you sweats yourself unnecessary he's red joe old dear joe's a spry young fella he looks as if he might be anchorin for a wife hey darlin he's the kind as vampires make their victims with a laugh but unwillingly joe holds out his hand meg as she looks in the glass her face brightens 
i sees a tall building with gold spires i hears a shout of joy and i hears stately music like what you hears in bartholomew fair ah to the lord mayor as made his speech i sees a man in a silk cloak he swaggers to the music i sees i sees she looks long in the glass and seems to see great and unexpected things her eyes are as wide as a child's at a tale of fairies it is no less a moment but how different than when lady bluebeard peeped in the forbidden door scarcely was little red riding hood more startled when she touched the strange bristles on her grandmother's chin but meg is not frightened she smiles she bends intently she is about to speak then she sinks into the chair behind the table i sees i sees nothing the glass is blank nothing just nothing at all ain't there no blood drippin no gibbets nor salamons swinging in the wind old meg is visibly affected by what she has seen the duke with a suspicious glance at red joe moves forward to look over her shoulder at the glass slyly she sees him she pushes the crystal forward and it breaks upon the stones then she rises abruptly she lifts a portentous finger she advances to red joe i sees danger for you joe who can tell whether it be death tis beyond my magic but beware a knife go not near the cliff you will see me again and in your hour of danger when you least expect it she is about to curtsy but turns abruptly and leaves the cabin darlin with shaken nerves runs to bolt the door there is silence except for the monotone of rain nice cheerful old lady i says you can pipe the devil up but she gives me shivers for just a minute i thought some old lady had died and left me her money-box the duke picks up a fragment of the crystal and puts it to his eye he examines it at the candle and turns it round and round he makes nothing of it and shakes his head you can dim me gig that's left i'm clean upset i ain't been so down in the boots since the blessed angels took flint to row. captain you and patches melancholy errand funerals wiping wheat eyes is jollier will you let a handed thirsty grog-eyed granddaughter of a blinkin sea serpent upset your happy dispositions stiffen yourself keep your nose up captain we has see enough we're not thumpin' on the rocks. You said it, Duke. I sulks unnecessary. There's old P.E. shinin' up there. Tomorrow night. If the wind holds, we'll see his starin' eye go out, and our lantern shinin' at t'other winder. He takes a pirate flag from his boot. He smooths it with affection. Then he waves it on his hook. The crossbones has hung on the masthead of the spittin' devil. Oh, Flint's wary flag, him as they hanged on a gibbet on weapon wharf. It was a murky night like this, with prentices gulpin' in the lanterns and Jack Ketch unsnarlin' his cursed ropes. I spits blood to think of it. I'll die easy when I've revenged his death, and the old clock is ticking peaceful, and Flint's sleepin' happy in his rotten coffin. A drink all round! We'll drink the health o' this here flag. You'll drink with us, darling. You spoils me, Captain. Everyone drinks. And now, we'll drink confusion to the swab that's settin' on the English throne. All drink, except Red Joe. He makes the pretense, but pours his grog out covertly. Our play is nothing if not subtle. 
Here's the old flint. Here's the old flint. It is bedtime. They all stretch and yawn. The captain climbs the ladder to the sleeping loft. Patch follows with the candle, warming the captain's seat for speed. The duke comes next, carrying his one boot, which he has removed before the fire. Darlin kisses her hand to the duke and retires to the kitchen. We suspect that she curls up inside the sink with a stew pan for a pillow. Rego lingers for a moment and stands gazing at the ocean. The memory fumbles in the past. I too hear familiar voices, lost for many years. A dark curtain lifts, and in the past I see myself a child. There are strange tunes in the wind tonight. Methinks they sing the name of Margaret. He climbs the ladder, and now, with an occasional dropping boot, the pirates prepare for bed. Presently we hear the duke up above, singing, rigorously at first, until drowsiness dulls the tune. It is set in port by the sailor's sort, as they squig all night at their rum, that a jolly grave is the ocean wave, but a churchyard bell's too lum. I agrees to this, and to give em bliss, from pew I learn the trick. I'll push em wide of the vessel's side, and poke em down with a stick. Darlin enters. With a prodigious yawn, she sits at the fire. She kicks off her slippers, and warms her old red stockings. She comforts herself with grog, and spits across the hearth. She sleeps and gently snores. The duke continues with his song. Old Flint has a fist and an iron wrist, and he thumped on the nose, it is said, till a victim's gore ran over the floor, and he rolled in the scuppers dead. But Patch, there's a few I'm telling to you, who's nice and they hate some muss, and a plank I contend is a tidier end. No sweeping, no scraping, no fuss. Captain Kidd went afloat, put the crew in a boat, and he shoved them off to starve. On a rock in the sea, says he to me. On a rock in the sea, says he to me. On a rock. The singer's voice fails. Sleep engulfs him. Silence. Then sounds of snoring. The range of Caucasus hath not noisier winds. Let's draw the curtain on the tempest. End of Act One